Hello, I'm Jackie Jacob, at University of Kentucky, and I am the uh, coordinator for the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice on e-extension, and as such, I organize the uh, monthly webinars. This month's webinar is uh, Dr. Dennis from the University of Maryland. She got her Bachelor's of Science from George Mason University in Virginia, her Master's of Science from the University of Maryland, and her PhD from um, Purdue University in Indiana. So she's been with the uh, University of Maryland for a few years now and uh, has an interest in small flocks and um, will be discussing environmental enrichment for small and backyard flocks. I will be on mute, but I will be monitoring the chat box and the Q&A box. If a question comes up that's relevant to what uh, Dr. Dennis is talking about at the time, I will interrupt her to get a clarification on something she's talking about. Otherwise, the question will be held for the end of the presentation. Please feel free to put in your question anytime. It's always best to do it while it's still clear in your mind and not something you forget about later. So uh, all yours, Rachel. Well, good afternoon. Um, and please do share your questions should you have any. I'd love to be part of a discussion more than just a, a lecture. So as uh, Jackie mentioned, my name is Rachel Dennis. I'm with the University of Maryland. I've been working and living with poultry probably my whole life. Um, but I've been working with laying hens, broilers, quail, all types of birds. Um, and one of the things that we talk about, especially in small flocks, as well as some of the new uh, environment or welfare friendly standards is environmental enrichment and what they can do. So I just love this picture. It was from a flock I visited out in Wisconsin because they took anything they had and made it welfare or environmental enrichment. So they had, as you can see there in the middle of the picture, um, a broken uh, picnic table. And the birds loved the broken picnic table. It's no good to them. It would have gone to a dump. And instead, the birds all seem to gather every morning at the broken picnic table. So environmental enrichments aren't necessarily these things we have to spend a lot of money on. They're just some things we need to think about what they can use. So really, let's just start with sort of the basics. What is an environmental enrichment? Um, technically, it's a physical or social surrounding that stimulates the brain. It just adds complexity to the environment to stimulate, and it actually does have physiological impacts. It stimulates synaptogenesis, so it actually changes the way the brain uh, forms and functions, especially early on. And it, generally, they um, result in a positive affective state or happy chickens or happy ducks, uh, whatever you might have. So one of the big questions I get all the time is what counts as enrichment? You know, I gave my birds this, they really like it, but I didn't pay any money for it, it was trash. I actually got that question from the gentleman with the broken uh, picnic table, but as you can tell, that is enrichment that they enjoy. But how do we find good enrichments? What are there bad enrichments? And I think that's sort of what we want to get to. We want to make sure it's not harmful um, in any way and sort of look at what we can do that improves their environment without causing harm, especially if you have a small flock that you're trying to sell. We can have some more issues with uh, food safety and those types of issues we want to avoid. So why do we use environmental enrichments aside from um, an expectation. The simple answer is it improves bird well-being, welfare, but they can also reduce injuries as well as self-injurious behaviors. Um, they keep home enticing. So if you have birds that are allowed to go outside, you want them to come back. Uh, so it, especially um, ducks, anything that can fly. Uh, I know people who have peacocks that stay around and others who can't keep them there, and you look at the home environment, it, they're not as well enriched. Um, they can improve health and immune function. They have direct effects when you see them directly in, interacting with the environmental enrichment, as well as indirect effects, which we'll talk about in a bit. And 
it reduces stereotypies. And anyone who's seen um, an animal in a zoo that wasn't a very good zoo, you might have seen some stereotypic behaviors, pacing. Um, with birds, sometimes you'll see uh, a lot of head bobbing and things like this when they're just bored. Um, and it becomes, it becomes ingrained in their brain, actually changes the way their brain functions again. I'm just going to give a couple examples. So if you do have a small flock where you're trying to sell during catch and transport, it's a stressful time. Even if you just have small backyard birds and you take them to um, the fair or something like that, it's a stressful time. They get created. There's a lot of new people. Um, and these are generally even the times when we see those animal videos of animal abuse in birds is when people are, are transporting birds because they're all new. And the transportation happens in all kinds of weather. And one of the main things we've seen that reduces injury and mortality, especially in production type birds, is environmental enrichment. The first thing is stock person training, but the second one is environmental enrichment. Um, so it actually yeah, changes the way they react to all these new people around. So it's sort of an indirect effect. It's not the environmental enrichment doing a job at that point, but it made them less stressful towards um, this stressful time. Another one is a major issue in all kinds of birds, leg issues, leg quality, lameness, foot issues. Uh, we can provide environmental enrichments that increase activity, provide multiple substrates to reduce the strain on the foot, perches that allow them to change the strain of the foot throughout the day so that it's not always on the same place, or reduces ammonia on the, on the pet. And correct use of environmental enrichments can improve foot and leg health. So I just really quickly want to talk about, when we talk about welfare, um, really where that comes from is the Farm Animal Welfare Council in England, UK, they came up with what they call the five freedoms, which is how they define welfare. So the freedom from thirst, hunger, and malnutrition. And we can use environmental enrichments to address that one. Be it freedom from discomfort, we can use environmental enrichments to address that. Freedom from pain, injury, and disease. The freedom to express natural, normal natural behaviors. And the freedom from fear and distress. And these are usually what auditors, so for those with backyard firms that have to go through audits, this is how they do their checklist to determine if uh, you meet the quality um, if you qualify as, as, as welfare, that all of the um, items are categorized in those five categories. So really, there not a lot of definition to each of those. The main definition given was for uh, thirst, hunger, and malnutrition, uh, by ready access to fresh water and a diet to maintain full health and vigor, which is normally supplied. So there's a little less use for um, environmental enrichment there, but domestic poultry really are eating machines. So we can use feed rewards. Um, we've even seen clicker training in chickens using feed rewards because they are highly motivated. So you can orient your enrichments with food to stimulate their environment because it is one of their most highly motivated behaviors. Freedom from discomfort. They define that as by providing an appropriate environment, including shelter and a comfortable resting area. So this is where we really start to get more into enrichment. Um, some of the main issues become with heat, heat and cold stress. Uh, especially smaller flocks, we don't have those huge ventilation systems, so we do have other ways to provide that uh, that we can use some environmental enrichment for. Um, confinement, the inability to rest undisturbed. Uh, which is more of a problem than sort of the conventional housing, but can become a problem um, in a small flock depending on how it's set up, especially the inability to, dis to escape. Um, ammonia and CO2 can become a real problem with discomfort as well. Uh, and if we have enrichments outside of the coop so that they can get out and are motivated to get out, then we can reduce the ammonia and CO2 buildup inside. Pain, injury, and disease is defined sort of by prevent, uh, the prevention of or rapid diagnosis of treatment. So that really has a lot to do with the rapid diagnosis with the handler. But what can we do for prevention? Like we said, 
lameness and foot leg problems with the larger birds, that heavy mass um, on the legs can cause problems with the lighter laying birds. We have that excess calcium usage. So we really do have a lot of flooring, a, a lot of uh, leg problems that we can help with flooring and environmental enrichments as we discussed before. But there are other things. Uh, we can get pain and injury from aggression, feather pecking, cannibalism in these birds. And there's a lot we can do to address those issues with environmental enrichment. Uh, GI disease, um, AI, and other illnesses, we can, it, there is some immune boosting uh, benefits from environmental enrichment, but one of the things that this uh, always highlights to me is our need to make sure we choose environmental enrichment um, that we can keep clean or that are degradable. Uh, and the freedom to express normal behavior, which is our only Freedom, uh, our only positive freedom, all the others are from something, um, by providing sufficient space, proper facilities, and uh, company of the animal's own kind. Uh, I think one of the biggest issues we have here is what do we consider a normal behavior? If we have something like the duck on your right, it's a lot closer to its uh, natural ancestors. We know a little bit more what a, a normal behavior is. But when you have something like a chicken that's a little bit further removed from its wild type ancestor, it's a little bit harder to determine what you it would you, what you would consider a normal behavior that you need it to perform. Um, also, all normal behaviors aren't necessarily positive. For example, fear of predators. Uh, so really, they consider the ability to walk, run, ability to stretch out the wings, and social behaviors, and the ability to escape. And finally, the fear from the freedom from fear and distress. So this is another one where we really can use enrichment by ensuring conditions and treatment which avoid mental suffering. Um, so one of the main things there is maintaining consistency within the house. And I point that out because a lot of people who really love their backyard chickens, and I know it's very tempting, I want to is you always want to redo it. Well, they're not playing with this. I want to keep it changed. I want to give them something new. I want to keep it interesting. Um, and to a some extent, that's good, but too much of that, and there's no consistency within the house, and they actually become more fearful, and you'll actually see a drop in leg, uh, as well as you can start seeing problems with uh, immune function due to high stress. Um, also, major procedure days, can create problems if you're doing house maintenance or vaccines. Uh, they can become very fear, uh, have a lot of fear associated with those. There's also a lot with genetics that you just can't change, we have to work with. Um, we can improve with nutrition. And the developmental environment, one of the things that's most important in reducing fearfulness in an adult bird is its developmental environment. Uh, Birds are very easily what we call behaviorally programmed, so we can change their adult behavior by changing uh, their environment when they're young. Again, a lot through environmental enrichment. The other one is open field fear. Uh, so if you have a giant open space, you want your birds, you have this huge open field for your birds and you're just so excited to let them out in it, there can be an open field fear. Uh, so you need to provide some environmental enrichment to make that comfortable. So as I said, there's that quantity or attempt at quantitative measure for welfare using those five uh, freedoms, but really you're starting to see a change over to something more like a positive effective state. Are these chickens happy? Um, it's so hard to measure each of those in any real way that people are starting to change the way they look at welfare. Um, and be more of a proactive rather than reactionary approach, especially since epigenetic or behavioral programming, that early life environment is so important, it's important to be proactive in your approach. But one of the great things about chickens, all birds, but especially chickens, um, is these are all pictures of housing for laying hens. So they're very adaptive. Um, the only thing that really environmental enrichments don't touch as far as um, our current housing systems is conventional cages where there really isn't any room for environmental enrichments, but we have confinement-free enriched cages, uh, 
cage-free with outdoor access, aviary, organic, small, large cathodes. So all these systems are going to be a little bit different in how they approach using environmental enrichment, but they can all be used. So if you have any questions of how to adapt it, please ask. Um, the first one is lighting. And we think of lighting as it alters reproduction, it's important for laying behavior, and um, but how can that be an environmental enrichment? And I think one of the most important ways to make this an environmental enrichment um, is through the UV lighting, UVA especially, which birds are tetrachromatic. So they see not only our visible light spectrum, but they see in the UVA spectrum as well. And a lot of the food they eat and their feathers reflect in that spectrum. So they're seeing social behaviors, they're seeing their food in that color. It'd be like if you spent a good portion of your life without the color red, how would you know somebody you know, all of a sudden you would see people getting angry and their face would get red, it might confuse you. Uh, so if we're, we're altering, especially early in life, we keep them inside and give them no UV light, and then later in life, we let them outside, and they have it, they have access to that UV light, and that sometimes causes a disconnect. We've actually shown that birds that get it later in life aren't, um, aren't as accustomed to it and have a harder time with social behaviors than birds that have it throughout their whole life. So access to UVA lighting is important. There are also a lot of variables to lighting. Um, and I think the main thing with some of these, timing especially, um, is consistency. Inconsistent timing in, in lighting in birds can become a real problem with welfare. Um, the location, you can put lighting over something you want to attract them to, feed or environmental enrichment. But increasing the spectrum really does increase uh, the enrichments that they will be access, they will have access to. This is just a slide from some work we did, giving birds a, a forearm maze that you can see up in the right-hand corner, where they had access to a forearm maze. They could be in the middle and see all of it. They could go be, no, be in the arm with no light, be in the arm with just UV, just white, or both UV and white light. And if birds were reared in UV and white light, they chose that 25% of the time, roughly. Um, if they weren't exposed to it, they didn't choose it that often. So early exposure to UV light really does change the way they see it. Um, another one that we don't think of as enrichment very often is social enrichment, but it's included right there in the five freedoms, and it's very important. Good social interactions are important, uh, and actually uh, social isolation, again, it changes the way the, the brain develops, but it, it changes these, it changes behavioral development. You see a lot more self-injurious behaviors, and then when they are introduced to other birds, you do see a lot of injurious behaviors. Or oftentimes they won't know how to interact and will become picked on and often cannibalized by the others. Um, so beware of some of those negative early interactions. Otherwise, the male to female ratio, and that's species dependent. Um, so really, that's something you need to, to look at. With most, most chickens, um, if they're in tight quarters, we look for a ratio of one male to 10 females. With quail, we're closer to one to four or five. Um, some of the less aggressive strains of chickens were again closer to one to f one male to four or five females. They're more harem-like. Uh, with ducks, a lot of times they are paired. So it, it again depends on what you have there. But trying to keep a, your your sex ratio species specific it is important. And again, the lighting is important for social interaction as well. But one of the things we don't think about is bird marking when we identify our birds. Now the one down here in the on the slide, this picture of bird has got his head painted black and his giant marks on either, these giant tags on either side. That's over the top, I recognize that, but it's to, to prove a point. Um, when you look at birds that are marked, especially like this in a group, um, if they're only 10% are marked, or even if 50% are marked this highly, they end up getting picked on and have more aggression toward them than those that aren't. Um, marks towards the tail usually don't create that much of a problem. But one of the things we think are, are nice and easy are wing bands and leg bands. But one of the most 
I would say odd things that I didn't expect to find when we did work with chickens because we did see that leg bands in uh, wild birds really changed um, mate choice and all kinds of social behaviors, but we didn't think it would be that bad with sort of the wing bands in, in uh, chickens because they're kind of hidden. This the asymmetry. If you have a wing band or a leg band on only one side, it brings about more aggression and um, it does change mate choice. And like I said, we see that in other species. I didn't expect to see it as strongly in chickens as we did, but we did. So to improve those social interactions and, and that social environmental enrichment, we need to be careful to make sure we're symmetric with, with marking birds with wing bands and leg bands if we do. Uh, another thing about social enrichment, it's great, but we said we want to make sure we don't do anything negative. The most important thing that we don't always think about um, is the ability of those birds to escape. Uh, just like people, sometimes you just need to escape an uncomfortable situation. Um, there's pecking orders you want to get away from, and sometimes the males are a little overheated in their sexual desires and they might be mounting the same female too many times and she just needs to get away. So providing that, I mean the first thing we think of is just enough space to do that, but that's not always possible. Uh, the other two options are cover and level. If you provide cover like this little toy chicken inside the, the under a little cover down there on the bottom left of the picture, that's a little cover we built out of acrylic. Um, and we painted it to give them cover, and we found not only a decrease in corticosterone, but um, their eggs they laid were bigger, uh, a lot less aggression in those animals, and a lot less damage to their feathers and their skin. So just providing a little bit of cover that they can escape through. Um, the other one I said was levels, a uh, levels that they can go up and down. Uh, sometimes the roosters do like to get up high, and if you can allow them that 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 access, then they might leave some of the uh, some of the females alone a little bit. Um, the other one is to provide some cool places, and the shade allows that a, a little bit of environmental enrichment, but it's also practical. Another one is sort of loose dirt and dust bathing substrates in the shade where they can really get that cool dirt in through their feathers. And dust bathing substrates is one of the early environmental enrichments that I think everybody wanted to add to laying hen facilities, but it became hard because in a, in a housing facility, that stuff's going to get in the auger. But if you have that uh, a, a area away from the augers, if you're not in cages, if you've got floor areas and, and outdoor areas, where they can get that loose dirt up in, in their, their feathers, that's really cooling, and it provides that ability to perform a natural behavior. In addition, it can help eliminate some of the ectoparasites. And ventilation is, I think, been said one of the number one um, welfare issues is ventilation. So obviously, uh, that that's important, but in some of these small houses, like I said, it's really hard to get that good, expensive ventilation, but you can kind of go old school. I've seen a lot of people do some wonders with hanging fans and even taking frozen water bottles and tying them to the fan to sort of cool that air down a little bit more. Water baths. We think of water baths a lot with ducks, and, and they should be available for ducks. But chickens use them too. Um, with quail, you have to be careful with water baths, um, especially with young quail and young pheasants have a tendency to drown in water baths. Uh, a lot of young birds uh, will have a tendency to just fall asleep in the water and, and drown, so you do want to be careful when doing that. Um, the next one, sort of flooring and foraging substrates. This is a great one where you have to have a floor anyway, and you can do so much with it that improves their well-being, allows them to perform natural behaviors, improves their leg function, their activity levels, so it improves their health. So we're hitting multiple freedoms here. 
And one thing is to avoid fibrous materials. I know they're down here on the picture in the bottom right, you can see the quail on a little bit of um, astroturf. And you can see how that astroturf's already pulling out. Well, that can get caught up in their toes, and it did um, in this instance. And they can also ingest it. And they can get caught up in, in their in intestines. So you want to try to avoid those fibrous materials. But some of the big, thick matting that they have available for boot mats and stuff, you can cut that up and add that in. Um, if, of course, if you can use the outside, all that natural substrate. But be aware of garbage type litter, um, as well as chemicals on the grass. Uh, a lot of a lot of chemicals on the grass can be hazardous to the birds. So just make sure you read the warnings. And you can be locally sourced with it. Locally, it's easy to get wood shavings, oak shavings, what have you, go for it. And I know some people who make their own, and they say, is this okay? And again, it depends on where you're sourcing it from and make sure that the plants are safe. Uh, but no, it's fine, and you will find a lot more. A lot of people say, well, I'm not allowed to use it as mulch, so can I use it as litter? The reason they don't want you to use this mulch is because you have a lot of bugs in there and they don't want the bugs up next to the house. So you will have a lot of bugs in, in your shavings as long as you're okay with that. It's a smaller flock, you, you know, the birds love to eat the bugs. <laughs> so um, it can actually be a two for one on that. But you know, you do want to be careful where you're getting it from. The other great one is hay bales. And you're starting to see uh, even Purdue using hay bales in their broiler flock. Um, usually if you're cautious, to be cautious, I take off the twine, but if you put the hay bale in there as a bale, they will scratch it out eventually and make put hay around uh, throughout the litter, but it gives them levels in the meantime, it gives them something to work. And it, they really do enjoy playing with it. So it's another environmental enrichment that serves multiple purposes. The other one's sort of duck and cover. Again, chickens like to, all birds like to be able to cover somehow. So, I mean, even the penguin up there, he's, she, that's the females up in the nest area and the males in front watching. But especially if they're gonna lay, they like some sort of nest box area that they can really be closed in for that time because it is a time where they feel vulnerable. So allowing that area where they can have a, a little bit of cover and control when they lay their eggs, reduces the stress, improves your egg um, quantity as well as quality, and um, reduces the stress on her. High grass is one that they don't like to get too far into. Uh, they'll go a little ways into the high grass, but you've got a few that will venture, but most of them stay sort of close to the edges. Um, but it is a good, it is a good environmental enrichment. It does give them that feeling of cover from predators. Like I said, the little huts that we we can you can easily build with acrylic or, or anything. Um, you can build them with wood, but just beware that wood is more easily contaminated uh, with with bacteria and viruses, so it's a little bit harder to clean. We have some PVC planks you can build that out of. Outbuildings. If you let them out, they'll just go find an outbuilding. And with our, our old farm, they were out in the, a lot of the outbuildings and um, sort of made them their own. And like I said, water. So we see, we think of water with ducks. You want to make sure you have water. These are actually pelicans at the, uh, I think those were at the Flamingo Hotel in, in, <laughs> in Las Vegas, but they serve the point. And then up on the right-hand corner, you've got chickens and a water trough. So chickens don't need as much water, but they still want, you know, that water's cooling and it's an environmental enrichment. You see they're all huddled around. You know, ducks really need um, the water as environmental enrichment. I know some people who raise them without having a pond and usually can have a, a kiddie pool or something. Without that, it really does, um, increase the chance of stereotypies and injurious behaviors without having some ability to just paddle around. But the one reason I like the, the pelican picture is it also provided 
a place near the water that they could get out. Even if they're not wanting to be in the water at that moment, it's still an environmental enrichment. So providing, again, even if it's water, multiple levels for them to enjoy. I'm going to see if I can make this work. Um, so we want to talk about feeding enrichments for a minute. And see if I can show this video, which may or may not show. Um, all right, I'm not going to show it. If you go to the our Facebook page, UMD Poultry, you can see it. Um, somehow I lost the original video. And it's a, a video of a woman that I met in, um, in Sweden who had taught a chicken to pick out the pink toy by clicker training. And because, I, as I said, you know, this, they're eating machines, so they're very highly feed reward motivated. And just like a dog, you can clicker train a chicken. Now, that's not really environmental enrichment for the chicken so much as it is for the person, if you're that kind of person. Um, but it's just to show how feed reward motivated they are that you can teach somewhat complex behaviors to a chicken um, just with food. So that's a good place to, to go for enrichment. And one of them is feeder puzzles. Now I've seen people use used water bottles where they pour feed in the water bottle and, and poke holes in it with a nail and, and the birds will go through and, and get out the feed. And it actually gets them moving and, and it's really good enrichment. The one problem I have with it is that that plastic tears so easy. And um, I almost put the picture up here, but it's a little bit disturbing of um, a duck that was, there are pictures of these all over the internet, a duck that was um, found dead and they opened it up and found just pieces of plastic all in its, uh, in, all in its digestive tract. And we worry about that. Chickens do tend to ingest less than ducks, but if you have a multiple species around, it can just be a problem. So if you're going to do that, that's great if you take it away as soon as they're done with it before they tear it apart. The other thing is PVC. So you can just simply take, you know, any PVC, put some end caps on it, drill some holes in, it's reusable, it's washable, it's safe. Um, and you just put some end caps on, take the end cap out, fill it. Um, and those are more, with those, you, you can do that with just about any species. Um, you can even do, like, they don't work as well with ducks, obviously. But <laughs> So I was just thinking, you know, turkeys, bantams, uh, all the way up to, um, with, you can use larger holes, and I've seen people do that with emus and um, ostriches as well, big PVC, obviously. Another feeding enrichment that helps is just supplement blocks and, like calcium. Instead of putting the calcium in the feed, let them get it, and then it gives them something else to do. But on the topic of, of Feeding enrichments, there's another one that adds sort of a benefit to the health of the birds. So beak and bill trimming is something that we have done in this country for a long time. It's banned in the EU. Uh, generally, we, at day one, lock off a large portion of the beak, somewhere between day one and day 14, either through a hot blade that cuts and cauterizes or through an infrared laser. And it reduces the damage from aggression and feather pecking, which can be severe and can lead to cannibalism. But one enrichment option is down here on the left-hand side from Roxell, which is their new feeder with sort of a grate in the bottom and also adding grates to other parts of the, of the house so that they will, when they peck at it, they will sort of smooth the beak. They call it natural smoothing. Um, so that's a good option to reduce having to do the, the beak trimming if you don't want to. Another one is using food as an enrichment. Just using human food that you, you know, it's wilted, it's stale, it's food you have that's gonna go to waste. You know, you see people hang lettuce for hens, give them old pumpkins after Halloween. Pumpkin seeds are great for birds. Um, after a barbecue, I've seen people take the leftover corn on the cobs and even string them up so that the birds have to go by and peck them and uh, they just clean the cob for you. And on the bottom left-hand side, you can see one of those sort of 
dog toys or you can just stuff old lettuce in, in there and they'll don't go for that. I just on that note want to be careful of some foods you want to avoid. So really, you know, onions and garlic, they're only toxic in really high quality quantities, but they will change the flavor of the egg and the meat. Avocados, apple seeds, but the rest of the apple is fine. Um, beans are great as long as they're cooked. Uh, dry raw beans aren't great. Uh, the nightshade family when raw. Potatoes, especially green skin, tomatoes and eggplant um, can become toxic in the high enough quantities or in certain states, especially potatoes that when the skin is a little yellow or green. Um, cooked, they're fine. Really highly salty foods can start to cause problems. Moldy foods, obviously, too much sugar or liquor. You don't want to give you chicken liquor. Um, but one of the main questions we get a lot is levels. How do I add levels? Do I want perches? Do I want ramps? Um, and I don't have a great answer for that that's universal because there is species and individual. Um, differences in preference and in what they can do and age differences but um, you do like to see that you do see that the, the hens especially like to roost a little high you know, at least two feet off the ground and a high rooster or a place where a rooster can go get high high off the ground <laughs> and, and sort of oversee his, his uh, territory can reduce a lot of that dominance aggression. It gives them a different way to display the dominance and can make uh, the social situations a lot easier. So one of the problems with, I just want to introduce real quick when we're talking about perches and levels, is the keel bone damage. So this, I went to the keel bone workshop um, last year in Slovenia, the EU's keel bone workshop. That's become a real problem with them. They've done away with conventional cages. And as you can see on this top picture, the score zero through four, this is what keel bones tend to look like after, um, after a bird's lived a whole life in, in one of these aviary systems. You get, um, depending on the research, between 56 and 97% of the birds coming out of those systems have healed fractures in their keel bones. So they've had some sort of collision either with another bird or with the furniture, the perches in there. So there's been a lot of work in looking at how can we improve that. So just for reference, in the conventional cages where they're laying down all the time, putting that pressure uh, directly on their keel a lot, they have about 12% of those um, and lay with, with heel, heel fractures. So they're definitely having there's a lot of research showing that there, it's collisions with each other, with the perches that, that's causing this breaking. And it's currently a major area for research in Europe, and we're doing some work here with that. Like some of the causes are housing, nutrition environment. Uh, genetics is a factor. There is a difference in, in genetics and how badly they get, they come out um, damaged, as well as how they like to use a perch or a ramp. So with that in mind, it's important to sort of really look at, at how we use our perches. So roosting chickens, really you should give them about at least eight inches of space uh, lengthwise on a perch. 10 to 12 inches is fine, you know, depending again on the size of the bird, a bantam might not need that much, a big um, a, a bigger bird might need a little bit more. Off the ground, though, you want it at least a foot off the ground. You don't really want to go much higher than 26 inches off the ground. So somewhere between one and two feet is usually good. Um, so that 18 to 26 inches is sort of a maximum. And here's the other one is, is that there's really a lot of research into is how close together you want to put those. So what they're saying is at least 18 inches now in between perches and other obstacles. That's what they're saying is they're jumping from one thing to the next and they're and they're it's too close or and they're hitting it. And a lot of people love swinging perches and they're great. And I've seen swinging perches a foot apart 
giant ladders between perches a foot apart, and those birds, I don't think a single bird came out of there without a fracture on it. Um, so if you like the swaying perches, if your birds like those, great. Um, make sure they're a little bit more removed from other obstacles so that they won't have those um, collisions as much. And the main thing they're looking at, though, is what kind of material can we use for perches? We've been using a lot of metal. Wood is a little bit softer, but especially as a tree branch can get have has a little bit more give when you nail a perch to or a wooden perch to a frame, it has even less give. But wood isn't really allowed to be used in most systems due to uh, the bacterial issues. So you use metal and PVC, and what some people are showing to suggest is use about a 3.2 centimeter diameter, a little bit larger, a little bit smaller, depending again on, on the size of your bird, and, and wrap it in a soft polyurethane, polyurethane cover. And they did that with a, I think um, this one study, well, that, that is actually the result of numerous studies, did that to an outer dimension of about 6.6 uh, .6 centimeter in diameter. So you can take something hard that can stay and give it a little bit of a, of, of a cover, and you may have to change that once a year or how, depending on what type of, of, of product you use, but you can reduce the damage to the bird. And they have shown that not only do um, these heel fractures cause them pain and discomfort, but they do also reduce the rate of lay. So it's not just an issue for um, Welfare is also an issue for your production. And the other question is, do I want ramps or ladders? Well, there should, again, we've got some species differences and some strain differences even within the chickens and some individual differences. But allowing some ramps, especially to a place where they need to go. So if you have a high entrance and exit from your coop, having a ramp rather than a perch system to get up and down that better, especially if Recent injury or younger birds are going to use um, are going to use that. I don't. There's not been a lot of indication as to which is better, a ramp or a ladder. Um, as far as their um, the health on their legs, but with ramps, they're definitely more likely to use them. And having them wide enough, at least six to eight inches. Again, it depends on the type of birds you have. Um, but the other thing we've shown is having a platform, a high platform next to the perch. Some birds will only use the platform and will never use the perch. So when you're creating levels, um, remember that a perch is not always a desirable high place. Some of them actually just want a small, um, almost catwalk that they can walk across. And then there's obviously the, what's some people call the ramp ladder combo, but if you're gonna put your ramp at a steeper angle, especially more than 15 degrees, so you can put a ramp at 45 degree angle, but use the um, slatted bars across to give them the added traction. Otherwise, it becomes um, an increased injury to the keel bones as well as the legs. Okay, hanging toys. Hanging toys are fun. Um, there have been studies on hanging string and letting them peck at the string. And for chicks, that's a great idea, but there are some considerations. You don't want to let that get down too close to their feet or gets caught in their feet. And you have to change it regularly and make sure it's not something where they're ingesting part of that. So I have a tendency to stay away from a lot of string um, because of the ingestion problem, especially for older birds. For younger birds, you can give it to them. They'll, they'll play with it for a long time before it gets so unraveled that you have to replace it. Bird toys, like the ones you see here, are the parrot toys. Well, these are these are lovebirds, sorry. Um, I put the lovebirds up here actually intentionally. So you want to go for birds that, toys that were meant for, for or is it lovebirds or parakeets? I'm not sure, ignore me on that. I think they're parakeets. Um, but they, I put the smaller birds up here, sorry, intentionally to make sure you could look at that and say, and, and, and we could say those toys might be a little bit too delicate for a chicken or a turkey or a duck. Um, you want, if you're gonna use those types of toys, use ones that are bigger and for the stronger birds like the parrots, that they can't break them apart. Um, but really they get mixed results. Um, a lot of people say they're just ignored. 
mirrors. Mirrors are an interesting one. We used mirrors um, and we saw very few birds actually interacting with the mirror, but we got a huge reduction in aggression and vigilance. So it doubled the size of, of what they could see, of the birds that they could see maybe, and, and, and reduce some of the stress-related behaviors. But they weren't directly interacting with it. Sand, gravel, and grit. A lot of people think they need that because wild birds use grit to help digest. There's really no need in poultry. Um, is there wild counterparts? Chickens, uh, the red jungle fowl doesn't use that. But a dust bathing substrate is, is nice to have. But be cautious of compaction, especially with some sands, if you see them eating it, especially if you have an otherwise barren environment, give them sand. You can start to see that they'll digest or ingest a lot of that, get it in their crop and impact it or in the, impacted in their gizzards. So try multiple strubs, substrates for your flock if you start seeing them eating um, too much of, of, of the sand. Also be cautious, as I said before, if it's near mechanics or, or augers. But the fun thing here is just get creative. You know, are your kids done with that soccer ball? I've seen chickens play with a dead soccer ball all day long. Old tractor tires can be uh, put out and they provide a little bit of shade, some cooled and heated, um, uh, dirt around them, so they're great. Scraps of PVC and acrylic that are too small for real projects. You can make a, a chicken feeding um, puggle or, or a, a, a hut. Old children's toys are great because they're so easy to clean. Or just a broken picnic table. And let them guide you. Um, use the bird's motivation. This is me down here in the corner. As you can see, that bird is not heavy. Uh, <laughs> So you want to be aware of human interactions. If you're too, if you're interacting too much with them, uh, like I said, you're constantly redoing their their um, their room, giving them more and more stuff. That can be a problem. So sit back, relax, and let them guide you. Um, sometimes it takes them a while to get used to something new. Um, again, be aware of direct effects, indirect effects, um, and again, too much may not be a good thing. So I just want to show you real quick some of the indirect effects that we saw with, for example, feather pecking. We saw a huge decrease when we gave them a hut. Uh, we saw aggression increase when we gave them a cuddle bone, but decrease when we gave them a hut, a mat, or a mirror. And pacing, the pacing that we saw in quail decreased with a hut. But the main thing about overdoing it is make sure you're not interacting with the ventilation. As I mentioned, ventilation is one of the most important things you have. So you can go to Granger's or just about anywhere, get a smoke ventilation test and run that in your house and make sure that if you put up some new furniture, you're not interfering with, with the way the, the air is flowing. And finally, just make sure you take into account contamination, infectious and conventional bacteria, viruses, parasites. Um, environmental enrichments can be an excellent reservoir if you're not careful. Use PVC, plastic, or degrade, or sorry, yeah, PVC, plastic, metal, degradable versus wood, gloss, and fibers, and regularly disinfect or change things out and be aware of toxicity. So using child, um, child toy disinfecting scrubs is usually perfect because they're already very protective of uh, toxicity. So uh, with that, I thank you, and I invite you to go look at that video on UMD Poultry <laughs> on Facebook. I did put a link to the video uh, in the chat box so that they can link directly to it. There was a question about tomatoes. Uh, you had said that tomatoes were a no-no. Um, Leah says that my chickens get into the garden every year and eat every tomato they can reach, leaving little for me. How much of an issue are tomatoes? Of the night um, shade family, they're actually probably one of the less worrisome, uh, especially once they're red. The young, uh, the, the more immature the tomato, the bigger the problem. Um, ultimately, in high enough quantities, they can become a problem. Usually when I see chickens go for tomatoes, they eat a little bit and pretty much just destroy the rest. Um, <laughs> just for fun, I think. Um, so, you know, just try to keep them out for your, at your benefit as well as theirs, um, but 
it's, with those, like I said, the eggplant can be pretty bad um, if they get a lot of quantity of the skin. And it's the skin on, on all of them, really. So usually with the tomato, they're not taking in too much of the skin. Okay. Are there any more questions? While we're waiting here, let me um, check my website here and see what our upcoming webinars are for people who that are interested. Our next one is on feeds and feeding for small and backyard flocks. And then in May, we're looking at poultry production over the decades to see what, what has changed and what has stayed the same. And we're working on um, one on being able to read your the behavior of your flock to give an assessment by simply reading the flock. And another one on using poultry and STEM, science, technology, engineering, whatever um, the M's for, math. Um, using poultry as part of that in training process. So we have some interesting webinars coming up. You can uh, check us out on Facebook. I'll put the link in here. Um, we have all the updates to um, when webinars are coming on, as well as when recordings are available. This was recorded uh, and will be available in a couple of days. I'm not seeing any more questions. Uh, okay. We got to thank you. That's about it. So um, thank you all for attending. I hope we'll see you here again uh, next month for our next month's webinar. So that's it for today. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Bye-bye.